Eugeniusz Romer, witam Państwa i zapraszam na kolejną naszą rozmowę w ramach Precis One Opportunity. To jest konferencja, która odbywa się tym razem w Gdańsku. A moim gościem jest pan Louis Wierenga, który jest wykładowcą stosunków międzynarodowych w Baltic Defense College. To jest szkoła akredytowana przy NATO. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so I would like to ask you about uh, something called the strategic culture of Eastern NATO flank, because your bio hit, uh, here at, at the conference says you are, this is your field of, of, of uh, your expertise. So what does it actually mean? Well, the strategic culture would be the line of thinking uh, facing a kinetic and also gray zone threats from, let's face it, the Russian Federation. Uh, also Belarus, which some could argue is just another oblast of the Russian Federation now, but that is the first and foremost uh, security concern facing the security environment of NATO's eastern flank. Now that um, runs from, of course, the Baltic to the Black Sea. I focus primarily on the Baltic Sea region, so Poland, the three eastern Baltics, the three Bs as we call them, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but also uh, Finland and Sweden. And um, you know, we just had a panel about the maritime uh, aspects. It's heavily land-focused, though, um, and that is somewhat changing, especially considering that Sweden and Finland have recently joined uh, the alliance. And so there's an increasing uh, attention being paid towards the maritime um, because, of course, Russia has the uh, oblast of Kaliningrad, which means that it's not uh, exclusively a NATO operating zone. So do you think that um, Baltic countries are really endangered by Russia? This is possible in the upcoming decade, for example, that Russia would, would invade them? Yes, I do. And I think that that threat never really goes away. It's been highlighted um, in NATO countries uh, west of the, the Baltic Sea region, but the kind of message from the three Baltic states has always been that this never really went away. Other people are just taking it more seriously now. Uh, but I can say that um, when I answer yes, uh, I'm not claiming to predict the future. And the, you know, the question that I get asked both within, you know, with my friends, with colleagues, with, with people that I encounter in the Baltic states and also friends and family back home in the United States is, is Russia going to invade the Baltic states? And of course, that's not really a, an easy question to answer because we don't know. Uh, but I come from a military background and in my strategic line of thinking um, as an, a an analyst as well, I would say that even if uh, we think the answer is no, we should always prepare for that answer to be yes. Um, so we are preparing for, for the worst. Unfortunately, yes. And another point to that is that a lot of people wonder, you know, they think that an invasion of the Baltic states would, would maybe look like uh, the second phase of the invasion uh, of Ukraine. And I tend to think that it wouldn't. It, it likely would not start with tanks rolling across with large airstrikes. It would probably be something very, very small that's very serious because it would test the resolve of Article 5. It would test the unity uh, of the alliance. But what it wouldn't do is put, and I hope that I'm wrong, but, but what, it, what it might not do is put equally a sense of alarm the further away you get from, um, from the Baltic theater. So I think that we have to be prepared for hybrid threats or gray zone threats against uh, allied territory to be amplified. We've seen this recently in the Baltic Sea with uh, boyos being moved uh, in Estonia, which is, is not actually a maritime issue, that's a police and border guard issue, but that came just after the, uh, you know, the mysterious map with redrawn uh, maritime territories of the, of the region. Uh, and also hybrid threats that are, I think, have a dual, maybe in a, a three-pronged uh, purpose. One, to say, we're here, you can't get rid of us. Two, to install fear in the, in the population. And three, and this is pro arguably the most important, each and every gray zone attack, like letters being sent, threatening letters being sent to children's schools or ministers' vehicles being tampered, to really very carefully assess the reaction from which country, which government body, which person, and paint a picture about how it would look like and how um, we would, we NATO would respond to 
X, Y, and Z. So that's, it's a, kind of not a yes or no question, but it's a little bit more deep considering how we know they work. So I see two very important issues here. First is um, very clearly stating our red line, uh, red lines as NATO. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what can we consider as an attack which triggers Article 5 and what is something that is, um, let's say, under the, the threshold of war? And second thing is how we're gonna react, as you, as you mentioned. So, for example, how long would it take for the Allied forces to come to the Baltic states to help them actually in, in, uh, in case of any sort of invasion? Both are very good, very important questions. And I think both, both of those questions are things that allies are still working out uh, because we realize collectively with the second phase of the invasion of Ukraine that the post-Cold War era of peace and prosperity is over and we have to rethink this, the global security environment, the European security environment, and then shrinking it more narrowly to, to the eastern flank. Now, to tackle the first question, um, you know, that is very, very difficult to determine because, as you mentioned, gray zone. Um, it's a political question when we say is it an act of, uh, of war. And you see this in cyberspace, and there's a discussion going on about cybersecurity. Can you really deter cybersecurity? And do you, you know, technically speaking, an Article 5 scenario can be triggered, uh, can be triggered uh, if there's a cyber attack that's deemed serious enough by one member state. But then that has to go to a unanimous decision in the NAC and the North Atlantic Council, and then it becomes very, very political. Because as we see right now, we haven't had the resolve of NATO tested uh, in the European theater by the Russian Federation yet, because of course Ukraine is not a NATO member, uh, not yet anyway. But um, we have to be very careful about agreeing across and try to be one or even two steps ahead uh, of the Russian Federation and say, if this happens, what do we do? If that happens, what do we do? And of course, uh, in democratic societies, we face elections, and those elections can translate into, uh, depending on which country, of course, uh, how the opposition uh, sees strategic geopolitical uh, environments uh, in which theater, and in this case we're talking about uh, in, in Europe, uh, sometimes you can have a transition of government and you don't have much change and sometimes you have drastic change. So um, that's one issue to contend with and that makes the question a little bit slippery. Now you talked about red lines. Yes, it's important to have red lines. Uh, but it's also important to reinforce those red lines. It's one thing to say that you have a red line, but when that red line is tested, you have to make sure that uh, you follow through. Otherwise, um, unfortunately, the deterrence credibility goes down a notch. It may not disappear completely, but it goes down a notch, and that's something we have to worry about because that sends a clear message. What I'm seeing right now in terms of the Russian Federation is they are tiptoeing and trying to hopscotch maybe across back and forth, but not firmly cross it, but trying to come as close as possible and because they realize that there are there's enough of a political voice that would say, hey, we don't want to stomach this. We want to de-escalate the situation. And they know that they hold, uh, unfortunately, um, the important trump card because they are the aggressor. And in the 21st century theater of conflict, it does seem with gray zone and, and cyber, and I would put cyber into the gray zone, but it's kind of a distinct category in of itself, that that is something that the aggressor typically has the advantage on. So that's something that needs to be discussed and, and likely will be discussed in depth. And I think we are at a very crucial point in time where we have a three to six year window to fix some of our capability gaps and to and that includes uh, a, a unified political stance towards a what if question a realistic what if at that uh, also of course with military buildups as well so so if you're saying the the discussion is let's say ongoing right now about these two issues i mean the red lines and the the potential reaction <clears throat> so what does it say about the the voice of the Baltic states, or the, let's say the three sea states, and NATO allies, um, is it like heard um, among the, the Western partners? Is it like very vocal? 
Very vocal, definitely. Um, the one thing that I, I have to give good you know, kudos and political credit to Poland and the three Baltic states is keeping, even before February 2022, uh, keeping their voice heard and keeping it relevant in Brussels and Washington. I think they've done a very good job. Um, there's only so much you can do outside of the confines of your own you know, political, political country and your own political party system. And I think that that is where there's a little bit of uh, a frustration because, you know, we'll see what happens with the ne next sec gen job. You know, there are certain countries that okay, it should be our turn to have this position. And there, again, it all comes down to political calculations. Why this person? Why not that person? We have to have a unanimous decision. Could this person be X, Y, or Z? So I think that in that sense, um, there, there might be um, more discussions to have in a couple of years' time. But I think right now, the, the line has been very, very firm. And of course, a lot of people are starting to say, well, you know, gosh, they were right. And we had it wrong, and they had it right, and we should listen to them. But I think that there's a, a, a kind of two things going on the further west you get from, from the three Baltic states. One is, I think it's not necessarily that I mean, it's just hard to quantify but it's not necessarily that people um, don't think that we're into a new era but they don't want to be there because who, who wants to be uh, outside of the uh, era of peace and prosperity but we're there and um, I think the further removed you are from a hot zone of potential conflict um, the more prevalent that that line of thinking is and the second is how do we prevent it from being worse? Where does politics uh, end and kind of a hot kinetic, uh, the, or the potential for a hot kinetic uh, war begin? And I think that people are trying to hold their breath. And I also think that um, everything is so interconnected globally with the Pacific theater, with different continents and different actors having uh, stakes in different continents that Quite frankly speaking, nobody wants to have a Franz Ferdinand moment because they realize the fallout. So I think that there's a lot of political caution that's being exercised, and there are pros and cons uh, for both. But I think when it comes down to it, um, with the Russian Federation, it's, it's clear that you're dealing with a geopolitical bully who doesn't really take seriously the types of... Um, liberal democratic foreign policy that the West is used to to try and de-escalate. And you probably hear a lot about uh, the war against Ukraine as a war of values, and that's, that's very true. So the other point to that is that you want to avoid, um, some people want, are saying that they want to you know, de-escalate, but you can't really de-escalate with a force that doesn't really respect on the same level our Western values. So to sum up, um, do you think that Article 5 is, is a credible deterrent and uh, is it something that is, in simple words, going to work in case of an attack from Russian Federation, which, well, w which we discussed before, an attack is not a, a clear, clear mm -hmm. term, right? Yes, I do. Um, our, our, the commitment to Article 5 is ironclad and the reason for that is because that's what the, one of the main things that keeps the um, liberal rules-based world order together is the understanding that an attack on one is an attack on all. And, you know, going back to a question that you asked earlier, when you asked if I thought that the Baltic states would be invaded, it, more no than yes. I'm not saying that, you know, we shouldn't prepare for that. We, we of course, should, and we are. But I think that that's the one thing that you know stops President Putin and his cronies from, from doing this is that they know that is a Rubicon because if they do something that would be considered an Article 5 uh, trigger, that alliance resolve is very, very strong. And you see this uh, after the second phase of the war against Ukraine, Sweden and Finland breaking with decades of foreign policy, formally joining NATO. Uh, and I think that that's the one thing that is a very clear-cut uh, deterrence, uh, because then um, you have the enhanced forward presence, you have bilateral agreements with the United States, 
and you have um, the Western world or the global West, let's say, South Korea, Japan, and Australia who are forging ties uh, with the alliance. So that is the one thing that is, um, I would say, our center of gravity along with the co cohesion uh, of the alliance. Okay, let's discuss future now, yep. uh, the, the upcoming future, the nearest future. I mean, July and what is going to happen in Washington, the NATO uh, summit. What is going? What is expected to to happen um, there? How about Ukraine? Because in the in the latest um, summit that we had in Vilnius, it turned out that Ukraine is not going to join mm -hmm. NATO soon. So, how about Washington? Well, um, certainly there's a lot to celebrate there, um, and, I, and I don't think that because of what's going on we shouldn't celebrate, I think we should. I mean, that's uh, 75 years of uh, keeping peace between great powers and letting about a billion people on the globe sleep peacefully at night. I think that's cause for great celebration, and I think it's uh, very well deserved that this alliance has grown since the uh, initial uh, treaty was signed in Washington. Um, but I also think that we should look at the other side of that, uh, and as happy as we should be, uh, and as, as much as celebration is merited, a lot of work to be done. Uh, and, and, and we have to make sure that in the next crucial window of, I said, three to six years, focusing on the shorter, not the longer period, that we make sure we have better development, better technology, uh, and better cohesion, and make sure that every single step that can be possibly taken, we are outpacing uh, all adversaries around the globe. Um, with Ukraine, I would like to say that they would be offered uh, a plan for membership. I'm not certain that that will happen. Um, I, I wish I could say that it would, but I'm not certain that that will happen. What I do think the big part will be is AI, emerging disruptive technologies, and how to build uh, militaries of the future. That's one thing. And then, of course, there's the elephant in the room, the 2% uh, of GDP for spending. Um, if ever there was a time to say that's a floor, not a ceiling, it's now. Um, it's unrealistic to think that anybody would get to or be willing to get to 6 to 7%, but I think 6 to 7% is what would be needed uh, to really put us uh, in a comfortable um, advantage. Um, and I think that uh, we'll see the brigade level and the enhanced forward presence uh, carry through. Uh, the Supreme Allied Commander Sacker's regional plans will likely be imp uh, approved. And then we'll see the new Sec Gen, the new Secretary General, uh, provided that they can get uh, a unanimous decision on that. And then if not, I guess we'll have Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, for longer. Um, so those are the, the key and crucial components that I think are the key and, cru uh, and crucial elements that will come up uh, during the Washington summit. So let's focus on the latest technologies. Mm -hmm. You mentioned AI and um, how it's going to be implemented into the military and how it's going to be uh, under the joint command of, of NATO. Uh, so um, as far as I know, there are some companies like Andrew or Palantir mm -hmm. in the United States that are using the, the AI uh, to um, to conduct uh, some uh, modern warfare. I don't know how to, mm -hmm. how to say it exactly. So, in your opinion, how is going to be utilized by, by NATO as an alliance? Well, the first thing is interoperability. That will have to be uh, something that everyone uh, gets on board with when, when allies infuse the, the latest cutting-edge technology uh, into their plans. Uh, the second thing is I think that you will see more and more private sector cooperation with allied governments. I think that's one thing, NATO Diana, for example, uh, is one thing that the alliance has gotten right because what they're, what they're doing is they're talking to uh, innovative people, they're talking to, to younger people, and they're talking to the tech startup people who are going to you know, play a, a key and crucial role in this uh, AI tech industrial revolution and um, the the most important thing about this here is that whichever actor and, I, and, and, and I'd like to think and I think that it will be the West but there's China there's Russia and then there's there's the West the global West um, and we see the global West 
coming closer and closer together because of shared values and shared interests. But whoever wins the AI arms race will be the power or the the alliance that will um, shape the world order like the United States did uh, at the end of the Cold War. So that's that's very important. And a lot of the questions that you ask are things that are currently being discussed, and we don't have a clear-cut answer yet because I think if I look at how technology is changing, it's changing so quickly uh, that it's very hard to keep up with it. I mean, if you were to ask somebody who's, let's say, an educator, uh, what are the you know cutting edge technologies in your field for education for X, Y, and Z? They might say, well, I know these, but these are only a week old or a month old, and a year ago I was using this tool, and now I'm using that tool. So I think that uh, you ask about implementation, there needs to be some kind of consensus about which country uses what and how that you know gets put into their national plans, and then of course multi-domain operations is another aspect of that and the question about cyberspace for example is it a different domain or does it get you know tacked on to air land and sea i think that the latter it's part of everything not its own separate space uh, these things will be discussed as well okay so um next question is about uh, let's say later future mm -hmm. so i mean um some analysts, they, they say or they believe that the, the system of Bretton Woods, and by this I mean the free, freedom of commons, is not going to last long because uh, the United States of America are not longer interested in maintaining it. So in this case, do you think that NATO will prevail? Could you please clarify what you mean uh, once again? So I mean, the, so some people claim or believe that the, the freedom of navigation, freedom of commons, is not going to prevail this this system because uh, the USA is not longer interested in um, maintaining it by providing security to maritime ah, um, 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 transport. So, do you think in this case, um, yeah, NATO will prevail if if this system fails or falls? I, I do, and I I don't think that it will will fall. I mean, it might sound cliche to to you know or, or overly. Uh, optimistic and I, I tend to not be overly optimistic in some areas I'm very pessimistic but I think that um, in the end uh, we will prevail and I think that the United States will stick with the system that it had such a large part uh, in creating and I don't just say that because I'm American I really do think that uh, the US uh, will ultimately do the right thing and case in point if you look at the bill that passed through Congress um, fairly recently. Uh, it was delayed, but at the end, the Speaker of the House, in my opinion, made the decision to go ahead and get this push through. Uh, probably, I mean, I, I, I don't know him, I have never met him, but I, I, I think that what he realized being in that position and what a lot of people who become senior congressmen or women or senators or presidents understand that the longer they're in politics, the more the U.S. cannot go away from or turn away from um, it allies and partners in the system that it created because it's just not an advantage to the United States. Um, I do think that the United States is stronger uh, with allies and partners and that allies and partners are a huge advantage to American prosperity and uh, if NATO and the eastern flank is stronger with America and NATO, NATO is all, uh, the United States is also stronger with those allies in NATO as well. So anybody that uh, I think goes against that is not making the right decision. And I don't think that, that will happen. I hope, but I also don't think. And my final question is, do you think that um, the next NATO Secretary General should be from the eastern flank of NATO? Do I think that they will be or that they should be? Both. It would be very, it would be a happy day if the SecGen came from um, an eastern flank country. Um, I don't think that it will be this time, but I think the time after, um, it gets harder and harder for certain allies to say no uh, we can't have somebody from here. I mean, most people think that it'll be former Dutch Prime Minister Mike Rutte. 
they'll have to vote on that, uh, and he might not, you know, get get the vote. There might be some countries that say, for for different political strategic reasons, no. Um, but NATO, the thing about NATO is NATO has a 360 degree approach, so they have to find somebody that really is right for the job, and um, you know, it's it's one of those things that. Right now, it's hard for somebody in one part of allied territory to say, especially if it's a, this region that we're talking about, what about this region? What about the Arctic? What about the Mediterranean? Uh, but we do have to keep a 360 degree approach. So do I think it would be good for somebody? Of course, it would provide a lot of knowledge that I think was, was um, not heard at the same level. Um, a lot of people talked about uh, Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kallas. Uh, I would not rule that out for the future. I don't necessarily think it will happen uh, in Washington, but she has done a very good job at showing leadership, um, going back to what we discussed before, keeping the voice of not just Estonia, but the Baltic states in Washington and in Brussels very loudly, very clearly and very consistently. So I think that we will see that, but I don't expect that to happen now. Thank you, sir. It was really interesting to, to hear uh, this, um, your answers, and it was a really interesting interview. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Dziękuję także, że Państwo byli z nami. Dziękuję i do zobaczenia.